physical geology students i hope you are having a fantastic weekend um, this is the third video for your monday lecture and it's going to be called summer 15 we're still working on chapter four i'm hoping that you will closely watch all of these videos before you do the lab which is about igneous rocks I'm trying to uh, get the main points to you, and one of the things I noticed was uh, that you need to pay particular attention to is I'm referring to igneous rocks that cooled underground with phanaritic textures as plutonic, but your author uses the word intrusive, and volcanic rocks are rocks that erupt on the surface of the earth as volcanoes with lava or ash. I call them volcanic rocks, so do most Americans. Canadians but your author was trained in the UK and so he uses British terms intrusive and extrusive so don't get confused uh, intrusive means plutonic extrusive means volcanic I've decided not to use the British terms we're going to use the American terms anyway so just keep bear that in mind bear that in mind it shall hold. Oh, never mind. Anyway, um, igneous rock bodies. Most people in the U.S. call those plutons. So we're going to call them plutons. Now, what are plutons? That's what we want to talk about next. You got this diagram here. And it's interactive. So if you cl click on this plus sign, that'll tell you that's a stratovolcano. Or if you cl click on this, that'll tell you this is a xenolith. Th that's going to be kind of useful in for you to study these um, igneous plutons and other features associated with igneous rocks. So do that. And before you click on the plus, try and guess what it is. And then see if you got it right. That'll help you quite a bit. But I've got a, a, another picture here that might help you as well. This is from the internet. And it shows you all these features. So let's take a look at this diagram. Here's the web address for it in case you want to. You can just freeze it and then type that in if you want this exact diagram. Okay. So here you see that volcanic rocks are shown here they cool above the surface of the earth and they are uh, affinitic porphyritic vesicular or glassy in texture plutonic rocks cool underground they have a phanaritic texture they have big crystals crystals are visible to the naked eye in order to interpret this diagram we need to learn two new words and the two words you need to learn are concordant and discordant what does concordant mean that means the igneous pluton follows sedimentary layers it does not cut across sedimentary layers a concordant pluton follows sedimentary layers a discordant igneous pluton is one that cuts across sedimentary layers it cuts across sedimentary layers now we're going to take a look at five different types of igneous plutons that you need to know about. I'm going to spell them out for you. We have dikes, sills, lacoliths, stocks. I was going to write stocks and bonds. <laughs> Batholiths. Okay, so you got five kinds of igneous plutons. Now we want to take a look at these five kinds of igneous plutons. On this next test, there's going to be pictures of some of these things, and you need, need, you need to know which one is which. Okay, Let's do them one at a time. Now when you see this diagram here, bear in mind that uh, here in the year 2020, we don't have holograms yet. This is a two-dimensional picture that's trying to depict three-dimensional igneous plutons. So, since we don't have plutons yet, 
I'm sorry. Since we don't have uh, holograms yet, we're going to have to try and visualize what these would look like in 3D, and I hope you do it. First one we're going to look at is called a, a dike, D-I-K-E. This dike comes out of the screen, so it's a planar igneous pluton. It's planar. It's sheet-like. That's even better. It's sheet-like, and it comes out of the screen like a sheet. Like a, a um, for example, uh, twenty or thirty sheets of white paper coming out. Only it's made of uh, phanerytic rock, like gabbro, diorite, or peridotite, or granite. It's coming out. So a dike is a sheet-like igneous pluton that is discordant. Next one we're going to look at is a sill. S-I-L-L. -L. A sill is a sheet-like igneous pluton. Does it follow the sedimentary layering? Yes, it does. So it is concordant. A sill is a concordant sheet-like igneous pluton, whereas a dike is a sheet-like discordant pluton. Third type of igneous pluton you need to know about is called a lacolith. And a lacolith follows the sedimentary layering. It doesn't cut across these sedimentary layering layers. And it pushes up the sedimentary layer, so there's a little bulge in the land above, a bulge in the sedimentary rocks above. That sometimes helps miners find these lacoliths because they can see that little bulge in the land. There's all sorts of uh, valuable ore deposits associated with all these igneous plutons. But a lacolith is an igneous, a concordant igneous pluton that is mushroom shaped. So there are two kinds of igneous plutons, sills and lacoliths. We got two other igneous plutons we need to know about. Stocks. This is called a stock. And this huge thing down here is called a batholith. Stocks and batholiths cut across sedimentary layers, so they are discordant, and they are irregular shaped. They don't have any regular shape to them. They're, they got all kinds of different, you can't really describe the shape. The difference is that stocks um, cover less area, usually less than um, 10 kilometers squared. And then batholiths cover thousands of kilometers squared or thousands of square miles. So a batholith is huge. For example, there's a batholith in eastern California that goes all the way north um, of Sa uh, Sacramento all the way down to the Mexican border, uh, covering thousands of, more than a thousand miles. That's, and batholiths are huge. They're, are, they're both discordant. Okay. I think we got the five different igneous plutons. And now let's take a look at some real world ones, not just cartoon ones. Here you can see a dike. Now let me see. Let me get a better picture of a dike here for you. The Brits, by the way, spell D Y K E. We spell it D I K E. Wow! Look at this. You can see this is a nice dike here. It cuts across sedimentary layers. Pretty felsic looking. It's a granite. Here's a mafic dike. So this would be a gabbro cutting across these sedimentary layers. Those are dikes. Here's a dike, a sheet like igneous pluton that's cutting across these sedimentary layers. There's one more dike right here. This mafic dike here, a gabbro. Now let's take a look at a sill, S I L L.
sill. Okay, here's a nice sill. This here's a felsic sill. It's not. It's following the sedimentary layers. Here's another sill. Cutting across sedimentary layers. That's a sill. This is igneous rock cutting across sedimentary. Not cutting across sedimentary rocks, but following the sedimentary rocks. It's called a sill. S I L L. You see the difference between a sill and a dike. So there be there might be a picture of that on the test. Uh, bear in mind that uh, you need to know those. There's a lacolith. It is concordant. Next thing we're going to learn about is Bowen's reaction series. A long time ago, back in the 1920s, Niels Bohr, an American geologist, came up with this very useful diagram and what this diagram shows you is the relationship between the temperature at which a ro igneous rock cools and its min minerals and its color wow that is so useful and I, uh, it is so useful in many ways and I'll show you how First thing you want to notice is that on, on the y-axis with Bowen's reaction series, we have higher temperatures up here in the red. These are temperatures going up to 1300 degrees Celsius. And down here we have much lower temperatures. And that these are temperatures going to about 650 degrees Celsius. So as you go this way, it gets hotter. That's why the color changes to red. Second thing you want to look at is your igneous rock colors. Fel your lighter colored rocks, felsic ones, are formed at their lower temperatures. And in their higher temperatures, you get intermediate rocks. The rocks become a little bit darker. And then they become even darker in there to form your mafic rocks, such as gabbro and basalt. And then they become very dark or green at your highest temperatures, such as prototype, comatiae. These two arrows show you that as our igneous rock becomes darker, it contains more iron. The more iron there is in the igneous rock, the denser the rock is, the heavier it is for its size. So an ultramafic rock is going to be a lot heavier than a felsic rock. It's going to weigh more if the rocks are the same size. The amount of silica in the rock is the opposite of the amount of iron. So that your more felsic rocks contain more silica and less iron. And your more mafic rocks contain more iron and less silica. Next thing you want to take uh, note of is the minerals in Bowen's reaction series. Under very high temperature, magmas are going to produce the mineral olivine, which is green in color. And these, going from, uh, th they spelled that wrong, it's a orthosite, but this and the, an oligoclase, uh, these are British spellings. Anyway, um, th this is plagioclase feldspar, these two here. But these are plagioclase feldspar. But over here, you can see if the, if the rock is not heated up to such high temperatures, they're slightly lower temperature, about 1,000 to 1,100 degrees Celsius, the mineral pyroxene comes out. It's black in color. And amphibole will come out at about 950 to 1,100 degrees that's called, also called hornblende. And at a very, if the magma cools from a very low temperature, it's going to have quartz in it and muscovite and potassium feldspar, K is for potassium. Ladies and gentlemen, this is useful. Think about how useful this is. 
if you pick up an igneous rock and you know what color it is, you know how much iron there is in the rock, how much silica there is in the rock, what minerals are in that rock, and at what temperature did that rock cool from. All by picking up that rock. You also know, it, did it form in the oceanic crust or the continental crust? Let's give an example here. If I have a mafic rock, such as gabbro, what minerals is it going to have in it? It's going to have plagioclase feldspar here, and it's going to have pyroxene in it. Maybe a little bit of olivine, but mostly pyroxene. And please don't forget the oceanic crust is made of basalt underlain by gabbro. So if you pick up a black igneous rock with big crystals, it's going to have a phanerytic texture. It cooled underneath the sea floor. It has a lot of iron in it and less silica in it. If I take a granite, which is felsic, it's going to be lighter in color. It's going to be pink. Why? Because it's got potassium feldspar in it. It might have, it'll have muscovite and quartz in it as well, because it's felsic. It's going to have less iron in it and more silica. It's found underneath the con it's found in the continental crust. Igneous rocks that are felsic are found in the continental crust. And it formed at lower temperatures. See how much you can get just by picking up an igneous rock? Let's do an example real quick here. A good geologist, will t he or she, will take a look at um, a rock like granite. Okay, let me show you what a, what a good geologist will be able to do. He'll say, or she'll say, well, I can see all the crystals in this rock, so it's as a phanerytic texture. That means it cooled underground. That means it's a plutonic rock. And since I, I can see these pink crystals, it's potassium feldspar, I see some quartz in here. That's a felsic rock. It has a lot of silica in it. This came from the underneath the continents because the continental crust is felsic. It formed under relatively low temperatures. And it's plutonic because it has a phanaretic texture. It cooled underground. It's phanaretic. See how much, see how much, and it, that means that the magma cooled slow in order to allow for the crystals to grow big. I figured all that out just by looking at that rock. It cooled underground, and underneath the continents. It's silica rich, it's iron poor, it has a phanaretic texture, and it's felsic. So if you put all that together, you can pick up any igneous rock and figure out how fast it will cool. Is it plutonic or volcanic? What minerals are in it? Is it felsic or mafic? How much uh, is it found in the continents or in the oceans? Olivine, that green mineral, is found in ultramafic rocks, according to Bowen's reaction series. There's uh, Norman Bowen as a young man. There he is as an older man. We do a lot of microscope work in in geology. These are old microscopes from probably around World War II, but we have much better microscopes now. Next thing we want to talk about is the geothermal gradient. The deeper you go in the earth, ladies and gentlemen, the hotter it gets. So that means you're going to form more igneous rocks deep underground. And where does the heat come from? It comes from radioactivity, radioactive decay, which we'll talk about more later on. All of this stuff here um, I, I'm going to cover relatively quickly because some of you all might take more science class and have to know this in more detail but I'll just tell you some things that can cause rocks to melt. Higher temperature causes rocks to melt obviously we all know that. 
the more water there is in the rocks, the wetter the rocks are, the easier they are to melt. Why? Because adding water to rocks lowers the melting point of rocks. It allows for them to melt at lower temperatures. That's what all this stuff is saying. Wet rocks melt easier than dry rocks. Where do we get melting rocks? We get them at the mid-ocean ridge where new sea floor is being formed. We get them under where you have mantle hot spots, where you have volcanoes that form above. And especially the most common volcanoes occur at subduction zones. As oceanic lithosphere subducts into the mantle, it melts and it rises to form volcanoes. I'm going to skip that because we've got so much stuff to cover. That's a lot of stuff to cover. Okay, th what this rock shows, what this diagram from your lab shows you is, therefore, now that we understand Bo Bowen's reaction series, we can use that sometimes as geologists to find ore minerals minerals that you can mine for a profit. Many of those igneous plutons, dikes, sills, lacoliths, stocks, and batholiths um, have ore minerals, minerals that can be mined for a profit. Now when you're a geologist, let's say you go to the University of Tennessee and get a degree in geology. You're, you're going to be hired by a company. Your company is not going to care if you um, can know what a, I'm, the main thing your company is going to care about is are you going to make money for them? So, um, what we want to be able to do is find gold, diamonds, rubies, opals, silver, copper, whatever the company is looking for. So your your job will, in many cases, be associated with finding these igneous plutons, and finding those valuable. Deposits. If you can make your employer ten million dollars, you've got. A, they're going to treat you very well. Um, I've been hired by companies to work in South Africa to look for gold, for example. Well, a lot of these ore minerals are are associated with igneous plutons. Uh, these uh, magmas that cool underground, forming these plutons, heat the surrounding water, and they concentrate precious metals, and gemstones, which are ore deposits. Take a look here. If a magma is heated to a very high temperature, then those, see the green minerals there? Uh, those are your, that's olivine, is going to come out first. Right, according to Bowen's reaction series. Olivine will come out first. Then you're going to get pyroxene. Then you're going to get hornblende. And on the very top, you're going to get quartz. And potassium feldspar. Bottom line is uh, sometimes the minerals will separate out. So you have your more mafic minerals on the form on the bottom of the magma chamber and your more felsic ones on top. Well, that is a great tool to use if you're a geologist. Because if you're looking for gold, for example, working for a gold mining company, gold is always associated with quartz. So qu gold will usually be on the top of your igneous pluton. When you're drilling uh, to find gold, uh, you have to pay a union crew maybe twenty to forty dollars an hour, and um, you don't want to drill all the way down here where there's no gold. So you can save your employer some money by drilling uh, by knowing where the gold is ahead of time, or if you're looking for rare earth elements used to make cell phones and computers you might find them associated with these more mafic minerals and you want to drill deeper. You need to know where to drill to to find the ore deposits. And you can use that using this what we call fractional crystallization where we know from Bowen's reaction series that the more mafic minerals fall, crystallize out first and on top of those you find your more felsic minerals. It's called fractional crystallization. So, 
these little red dots from your book show you where we have active volcanoes. We don't have any on the east coast. They're all on our west coast, notice. In fact, the main place where we have active volcanism is at subduction zones, which are associated with deep ocean trenches. We have, deep we have subduction occurring along the west coast of South America, the west coast of Central America, the west coast of North America, going through the Lucian Islands, up here to Kamakacha Peninsula in Russia, all the way down here to Japan. Japan has a huge amount of volcanoes. Down to the Philippines, through Indonesia, through Papua New Guinea, all the way to New Zealand. This, ladies and gentlemen, is called the Ring of Fire. See, which is, so don't forget, it burns, burns, burns along the edges of the Pacific Ocean. I fell down into a deep ocean trench, and it's associated with subduction, and it burns, burns, burns along the edges of the Pacific Ocean. So that's the main place where we have volca volcanoes. Second place we have volcanoes is in the Mediterranean. Think of Italy and Greece, all the way to Saudi Arabia. This area here, the Mediterranean, also has subduction. Subduction volcanoes produce violent volcanic eruptions, like Mount Vesuvius, Mount St. Helens, which erupted back in 1980 in Oregon, Mount Katmai, in 1912 it was a violent volcanic eruption in 1912 I remember I was there yes I was there in 1912 I was standing there watching that erupt um, I've been taking a lot of vitamin E and uh, HGH and um, I've managed to slow my aging down but I remember in 1912 when it erupted Later on in 1914, I voted for President Woodrow Wilson. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so anyway, we have um, volcanoes occurring along the edges of the Pacific and the Mediterranean. That's where we have our violent volcanoes, our explosive volcanoes. The other place where we have volcanism is at the mid-ocean ridges where new sea floor is being formed and at hot spots like the Hawaiian Islands. Here you can see basalt erupting at the mid-ocean ridges, that black aphanitic rocks. And it forms these things called pillow basalts. Why do we call them pillow basalts? Because they kind of look like a pillow. The uh, uh, mafic lava erupts onto the sea floor and it cools quickly as it comes into contact with cold water, making these pillow basalts. Well, we find pillow basalts in uh, near Johnson City. What's that tell us? Think about it. It tells us that Johnson and, and those basalts are 280 million years old. What does that tell us? It tells us Johnson City was under the ocean 280 million years ago. Here you can see the volcanoes around the world. Don't forget, subduction zones produce violent volcanoes. And um, in the next video, we'll talk more about volcanoes. So I'm going to stop it right here.